Tim, take it away. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're talking first about why we're here today. So uh, I, I, as, as a digital agency owner um, who builds the internet for a living, um, and I think most everybody on this call is probably somehow, some way related to, you know, building digital products and services. Um, I started learning around 2010, 2011 about the internet's massive environmental impact um, and uh, wanted to do something about it. And uh, so really started thinking about how the products and services that we at Mighty Bytes design for our clients can in turn be made uh, to reduce emissions and, and, and address climate change and issues of sustainability. Um, and so over the past decade or so, we've been evolving and tweaking our process uh, to, to make sure that uh, the, the work that we do is, is better for people and for planet, um, as well as for our, our customers and their users. So uh, next slide, please. You've, uh, there you go. Thanks, thanks Nicole. Um, so today we're going to just talk about kind of what came out of that and what came out of that for uh, Whole Grain Digital, uh, who's across the pond from us in the UK, um, and the practices that our two agencies have uh, put together uh, around applying sustainability principles to digital products and services. Um, so uh, next slide, please, Nicole. Tom, I'm going to throw, throw this your way. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, over a whole grain, we've been massively inspired by what Mighty Bytes have been doing for for about a decade, and you know, being way ahead of the curve com <laughs> compared to the industry at large. And and we're really kind of following in, in their footsteps, trying to get up to speed with this concept of sustainable web design. And really, what it means in essence is is an approach to designing digital services that puts people and planet first. I mean. We're obviously, you know, traditionally in digital projects, we're talking about business requirements and user requirements, but at the core of that, like any form of good design is like actually design that's responsible for society, design that is responsible from an environmental point of view. And I think it was must have been a couple of years ago now, we teamed up and Mighty Bytes, uh, Whole Grain and, and some other people in the industry that are sort of thinking along these lines, including some, some people who I think are on this call, and created the Sustainable Web Manifesto, which had six, six principles. And you can, you can read these in more detail at sustainablewebmanifesto.org. But the, the principles are clean, efficient, open, honest, regenerative, and resilient. And we'll go some of the, through some of these things in the later slides, but essentially what we're talking about here is clean energy, so renewable energy sources powering the web, efficiency in terms of um, minimizing energy use wherever possible, um, open and honest to kind of largely like tie this in with the human aspect of, of design, but also you know, can have environmental benefits as well in, in terms of sharing knowledge and resources and avoiding um, you know, greenwash, which, which is sort of one of the, the, the hazards of um, sort of green design. Um, and then regenerative is really about thinking about, you know, what is the impact of these products, not just in terms of kind of technical, um, like energy or carbon impact, but also like what's the kind of bigger impact on society and the environment? And is the, is the cost of what we're doing having a net positive impact on the world? Um, and, and, and resilient is about making sure that things are, are fit for purpose, that, that people um, can use these things, can use the products that we make in the places they need them, when they need them. So um, that's a very kind of quick top level overview of these sustainable web manifesto principles. Nicole, can you uh, advance into the next slide? I think uh, this is the this is the screen grab of the actual manifesto itself. Anybody can sign it. So if you're on this call and have not signed the Sustainable Web Manifesto, please do it. As Tom said, it's at sustainablewebmanifesto.org. Next slide, please. So uh, per what Tom was just saying, uh, there are a bunch of strategies that we came up with uh, for. Uh, sustainablewebdesign.org. We, uh, Mighty Bytes, uh, put sustainablewebdesign.org out in 2013, about the same time we released EcoGrader, another tool that we worked on. 
Um, and we, like I said, we earlier we've been you know kind of tweaking these 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 uh, approaches uh, to what we do for a living um, and and coming up with some kind of broader categories. So when we redesigned sustainablewebdesign.org, uh, the categories that we came up with, which are also relevant in Tom's new book, um, were design, client, and project ethos. So like, what is the actual uh, thing that your project is is promoting and and stands for? Um, content and marketing, so the idea being getting people efficiently to the, the co to content that they need. Uh, web development, hosting, and then uh, business operations. Uh, next slide, please. We are at the um, open discussion of some of these topics now. So to open this up, um, I thought that it might be interesting to just uh, meditate on this uh, opening quote that we have good design is as little as possible. Um, Tim, can you tell me like what that means to you necessarily? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so when I was working on designing for sustainability, the, the one, of, one of the biggest um, kind of things that I wanted to get uh, across was that, uh, you know, good UX practices and more sustainable UX practices are really about helping users accomplish the tasks that they need as quickly as possible. So while Dieter Rahm's quote is, you know, relevant to architecture, since he was an architect, you know, for those of us who build digital products and services, it's really relevant in terms of making sure, you know, if you're putting together, you're not putting obstacles in the way of users and, and, and getting them to, to fill out forms or whatever it is that they need to do, um, that, that you're, they're doing that as quickly as efficiently as possible and that there are no barriers to, to being able to do that. Um, Tom, do you have anything you want to add to that kind of general philosophy around, you know, what sustainable UX design would be? Yeah, and I think it's very much kind of a, a less is more approach in a, in a sort of holistic um, sort of minimalist principle across the board in, in what we do in digital. So obviously like user experience, like Tim said, keeping those um, keeping those experiences really, really streamlined, but also just in terms of things like the detail of our aesthetic designs and what are we including in them? Because that all of that information adds up, um, both in terms of mental clutter for users, but also in terms of like information that has to be stored and transmitted. Um, so I think just sort of keeping sort of minimalism and, and less is more as, as a sort of overarching principle is, is, is really beneficial for people and planet. Yeah, yeah. Next slide, please, Nicole. So for um, for each of these, we decided, you know, was, we 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 only had an hour for a, for a webinar, and and as you can probably imagine, um, each of these, uh, you know, six principles or st six strategy categories has a lot underneath them. Um, and in fact, uh, the the website that we've been working on is a very much a 1.0 release. We plan to add a lot more content to it to make it more useful. Um, so, you know, these examples that, that uh, we're going to talk through are really um, high level and purposefully so because we could spend several hours talking about each one of these. Um, however, the idea is to get across the basic concepts and, and uh, in each of the sections on sustainablewebdesign.org, we list several resources for each. So. Um, in terms of the optimizing design assets, that's really about like compressing images, compressing videos, making sure everything is optimized for performance across, you know, platforms and devices as possible. Um, prioritizing colors that use less energy. So, you know, different uh, lighter, lighter, lighter colors like white, white backgrounds and stuff on OLED screens use more energy. Um, reducing steps in UX tasks, as I mentioned earlier. Reducing the number of custom fonts that you use. Um, respecting user privacy. I think that's, you know, there's an efficiency thing there. If you're, you know, not respecting user privacy, you're pulling a lot of data that maybe you don't need and that your, your, your users don't want you to take. Um, and so making sure that that's, that's a really key and important element to the work that you're doing. Um, and then finally, you know, putting this in here, accounting for human and non-human stakeholders. So I think you know, in our UX practices, we're, we're, we're kind of, it's drilled in us to be focused on users and, and that's really inc incredibly important. Um, however, you know, there are, as the whole purpose of this conversation, uh, non-human stakeholders like the planet that are involved in our projects, whether we know it or like it or not. And so um, making sure that you're taking that into consideration. Um, sometimes uh, some of the things that we found helpful in, in early parts of, of, of projects and just in conversations about projects is, you know, kind of just mapping out who the stakeholders are and what the ecosystem looks like and such. Tom, do you have anything you to add to this in terms of the high level design strategy examples? I think that's a, I think that's a really good overview. And I think um, 
I think, again, you know, it's just about thinking through every detail. One of the things we found is that attention to detail is really the key in kind of the design, that most of this stuff isn't, isn't high tech inherently. It doesn't necessarily require, um, you know, sort of new skills or, or specialist tools. A lot of it is just spending the time to really think about every detail and, and ask yourself, is this necessary? Is there a better way? Could we streamline this? Yeah. 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 Next slide, please. Absolutely. All right. Um, and now we're talking about client and project strategies. Um, so for me personally, um, when I think about sustainability, a really important part of that conversation is the way that sustainability extends beyond simply the um, environmental impact, but also upon like how it's um, how it impacts the individuals who are involved in the process. So as this quote says, um, during the design and development process, there are often um, choices that are made about who is allowed to participate, how that happens. And these are all acts that have a political charge to them. Um, so I guess the question here is how do you um, take that into account? And um, how do you make sure that you aren't ignoring, ignoring the act of, um, you know, involving stakeholders or taking the uh, cowardly way out, as um, Mike puts it. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, I think, uh, we, you know, we had a, in our prep call for this yesterday, we had a, 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 an interesting discussion about like exactly, you know, figuring out what it is the projects that you choose to work on are going to actually promote. Um, and, and a lot of our conversation revolved around saying no to bad money and, and what the term bad money means, since it could mean different things for different people. Um, but, but overall, the general gist is, and I think both Mighty, Great, Mighty Bytes and Whole Grain Digital share this, that, that the ethos that we want our projects to, to kind of put out there in the world is, is using business for, for, as a force for good, making sure that, you know, people are, 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 are you know, included and, 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 you know, strategies for justice and equity and diversity and inclusion are included in the work that we do and stuff. And so, you know, I think we're not alone either. I think many of the people obviously on this call are, are, are share that same kind of idea. Um, so next, next slide, Nicole. These are some of the strategies that we put together for a client and project uh, uh, ethos um, for sustainablewebdesign.org. The idea of incorporating, as I said earlier, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and making sure that we're including diverse stakeholders in our projects. That's diverse stakeholders makes for better projects. That's just a fact. Um, and then, you know, promoting good health and wellness. So for us, that means work-life balance, you know, making sure that, 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 that um, you know, the, the actual execution of the project um, you know, helps, helps keep stress levels at a minimum. These, like a lot of the, a lot of us who are in digital agencies work on big, long projects that take many, many months and that can be um, very stressful over, over time and stuff. So figuring out how to build, you know, regular check-ins to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to our health and wellness as we go through the projects, as well as making sure that the project itself is, is also promoting those things. So, I mean, at Mighty Bites, we don't, you know, we wouldn't do a project for a, a tobacco company, for instance, and and you know that's that's the kind of kind of clients we look for are aligned with what the, the values that we hold hold as a company. Um, promoting equi equitable wealth distribution, uh, I think that's really about like paying paying a living wage and just making sure that the project that you're you're working on is is uh, um, is is also, you know, putting that. I, I think you know we we're in that place right now with the gig economy where. Um, income inequality is becoming a bigger and bigger issue um, in, a, in, a, in our industry, especially. Um, and so figuring out, you know, how do you actually make, make uh, decisions around the projects that you're working on so that equitable wealth distribution is, is part of the mix as well. And then finally, uh, just, you know, having a, a project that supports more sustainable behavior. So, you know, that works down to the page level where, you know, maybe you're offering more sustainable shipping options, but then when it, when it goes all the way up to the client and project level um, where, you know, you're just making sure that like the projects that you're working on are, are supporting, you know, more sustainable behavior, behaviors. It's, I want to say that all, all of this said, it's not always possible. And, and I, we acknowledge that. And I acknowledge that. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to this, Tom. Um, I know we went back and forth on this a little bit, but. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think firstly, it's important to say that this is one of the most highly subjective <laughs> areas of like sustainable design and 
and and I think there is there is no like you know kind of black and white perfect way of doing things but I think what's really important is that like project teams form their own vision of what they think is like the right way to run a project and that they kind of hold that in their minds right from that foundation of a project and um and the onboarding of a client even um right. through through to its conclusion but but also in terms of sustainable behaviors there's the kind of day-to-day -day workflow of like you know do we need do we need to kind of have physical meetings if that's going to be like if we're not local and we have to travel a long way possibly even fly for a meeting for a web project is that is that required or could we run our projects in different ways that are inherently more sustainable right and no time has that been more evident than the past year <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah for sure uh next slide please all right um so content marketing and uh, content and marketing strategies. So um, this is a really important one to me personally. Um, don't put something out there unless it matters to you and your audience. If you publish something useless, you're not only wasting time for yourself and your visitors, but you're also adding to the weight of your website and the web itself. So this quote is all about um, intentionality in terms of the content that's produced and posted and making sure that things that um, you put out into the world uh, have some sort of purpose. Um, and I was wondering um, a bit about like, how do you assess what is useful to an audience or um, how do you make sure that, what is the process of deciding like what is important enough or what is useful enough to publish? I guess, because there's a lot of incentive, I feel, to publish things that aren't kind of important or just kind of generate clicks. And there is a difference between those two things, right? Sure. Tom, this one's your, yours. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it sort of comes back to this principle of, of minimalism. And I, I think Jeremy, Jerry McGovern talks in his book, World Wide Waste, a lot about like the, the huge amount of of just waste that there is on the internet of content that's being stored and that people are loading um that's really not adding great value to people you know maybe maybe it's even okay content but it's just like duplicate there's like thousands of other articles that basically say the same thing and it's just there to try and kind of attract some clicks as, as nicole said and and so i think in content planning it's really important to start with looking at who are the actual stakeholders of a particular web service and what is genuinely useful to them and actually do that research into how can we give them the stuff that's useful to them in the most concise way possible because if it's not really streamlined and concise then you're you're making it more difficult for them you're wasting their time um, so focusing really in on like real human needs um, is a good lens to actually streamline content and, and strip out things that that it's actually getting in people's way um, and, and testing, you know, if you're not sure, like, you know, that's what analytics is for us. The one good use of analytics right. is like to find out is, <laughs> is this content useful for people and, or is it a dead end that people like, you know, coming into a piece of content and then bouncing straight out because it's not really what they're looking for. Um, identifying those pain points. Uh, Nicole, do you want to go to the next, uh, next slide? Yeah. So I, 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 lo I love that quote from Andy. Uh, B B uh, Orbit Media Studios is right up, up the street from Mighty Bytes. They are also a B Corp. Um, and uh, Andy and I have had conversations about this, this whole idea of creating content that's useful for your target audience for years now. And, and I think, you know, we all get it in theory. And, you know, the, the reality is in practice, especially, you know, if you're working perhaps with clients who just, you know, want to throw everything out there and they want all the things to be on the website. We have had many clients like that in the past. And how do you have those conversations to help them understand like, look, we're, we're working to create content that is truly useful for your target users. Um, and, and I think that's a, it's not an easy, it's, it's an easy sentence to write. It's not an easy thing to do in practice, I think. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, part and parcel with that is also making content accessible and easy to find. 
um, you know, making sure that users with disabilities can 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 access the content, making sure that you know anybody who who you know you're kind of following SEO best practices and making sure that you know in addition to focusing first on humans and the humans that are going to read it, that you're also optimizing the content in a way that is sufficient um, and also helps you know, people with screen readers and assistive technologies, you know, uh, uh, absorb it and, and understand it. And then also, you know, making it easy, easily by following web standards and, and SEO practices for, you know, search engines to find it and, and serve it up in search engine pages. Um, and I think the last point on this thing is, you know, you, you really uh, 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 brought up the point of considering content's end of life. I think I know we're not very good at like, you know, we regularly audit our content, but we don't necessarily plan for like, when is this post or when is this section of content going to be no longer useful? You know, like I think, you know, it, it's, we can put expiration dates on it and stuff like that. But I think that, you know, it's, it's easy to focus on what's here and now and looking forward as opposed to kind of going back and being like, oh, that blog post la I wrote last year about topic X sucked and nobody nobody <laughs> nobody read it and nobody and so we should figure out what to do about that do it do with it you know yeah i think you know content strategies are nearly always content creation strategies there's very rarely discussion around like you know how long is this going to stay online should we update it in six months time a year's time you know whatever it is it's just you create it it's you create it you set it live and, and you forget about it. But there are real benefits to streamlining that content, not just in terms of an easier user experience because there's less clutter, but also there can be kind of better commercial results. We've got a client who is really on top of their content strategy um, in a kind of long-term sense. And they, they keep coming back to it and they find that the posts that they regularly update you know, every few months because of the, the topics they're talking about are quite, um, you know, that they evolve over time. So rather than constantly writing new articles that are kind of an evolution of the same thing, they keep going back and actually just updating yeah. the original articles on these kind of evergreen topics. And they find that those are consistently the ones that bring in the most traffic and the most um, revenue for them as a client. Yeah. So I think there's real value in valuing old content um, as much as creating new content. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's for, for sure. We, we've taken a, 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 a approach to our own blog with that and similar to that over the past few years of just making sure that, you know, things that are, that are, have, have been out there for several years, are they still useful? Are they still, you know, the things that, that we want to, and do they need to be updated? So then let's, you know, put the effort into making sure that the information is as useful as possible. Yeah. So, next slide, please. All right. Um, we're at developmental strategies now. Um, so, uh, as web applications continue to grow in their scope and ambition and functionality, um, so too does the amount of data that is needed to, that needs to be downloaded by each application, and that, uh, continues to increase at a steady pace. So, um, as this continues, uh, so too does the, uh, uh, does the, uh, what's the word? Amount of data? <laughs> Does the yeah, uh, but also does our uh, quest to fully optimize our delivery of that of great performance, um, and that is com a uh, complicated, technical, and uh, hard to reach uh, conclusion. Um, I guess how do you properly optimize uh, all of this data that needs to be downloaded? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, that's a. I mean, that's an on, ongoing, moving target. The the strategies for, you know, everything from minifying scripts to to you know uh, optimizing images, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's you know a, a constant thing, and it's a lot. I mean, it, there's a there's a, a lot there. You know, um, I think one of the things that that uh, could be useful, um, and that I think we personally, as as a company, need to need to do a little bit better at, is is creating page weight budgets. I love the idea of those and, and, and um, you know, but we haven't had, uh, we haven't been as good as I think we can be as a company in using those and then also helping clients kind of understand their benefits. I don't and know. Tim, um, do you wanna just, do you wanna just quickly, um, for anybody who's not familiar with the concept, just to introduce what a page weight budget is. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, so page weight budget is basically setting, there's performance calculator um, that you can use. That's what, that what we've been using. Um, and you can go in and uh, I can't, I don't have the link to it handy, but I'm sure someone in, on, on here can actually 
Uh, I think if you just Google performance calculator. Um, I think it might be performancebudget.io yes, from memory. Right. You are like correct. That. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, so, you know, just setting kind of a, a, a target ceiling for the, the data that you're using on each page um, um, and then understanding, you know, and, and, and that comes with understanding who your users are and, and making sure that you're optimizing for the widest possible, uh, you know, low bandwidth users, widest number of devices and platforms, um, and just making sure that, that uh, uh, you know, the, the data rate that you're, that you're doing is, is as optimized as possible and as, as minified as possible. And so setting a per page data ceiling um, and then using the performance budget.io um, uh, uh, to, to see where, how, how good you're actually applying to that. I don't know, Tom, if you've had other uh, kind of use cases for, for, for doing that? Um, yeah, I mean, the page rate budget absolutely is a kind of a key, a key strategy for us. I think, and I should just say the performance budget tool, um, Antonio just posted the link in the chat for anybody who's interested in looking at that tool. Um, Thank you, Antonio. <laughs> but I think just in general, like what this quote kind of sums up is, is this classic issue in computing of feature creep. You know, and it's always been the issue since like the first computer I ever had, which is that, <laughs> you know, a few years down the line, this super fast machine that you had suddenly seems to be going at a snail's pace and, and you can't, you can't buy any new software that will actually work on it. And, and we've kind of, you know, got the same issue on the web where the faster the internet gets, the more powerful, uh, not just data center processing, but, you know, the phones and and computers that we're using uh, as end users are, um, are using, the more powerful everything gets and the faster everything gets, the more we can use up that, um, that potential. So we add in more bloated code, we add in more features, we use larger files. Um, and, and so, although, you know, yeah, the internet's got faster in terms of like user experience, perception, perceived speed, but actually behind the scenes, it's nowhere near as fast as it, as it could be. Um, because we're, we're always kind of eating into the, that advantage that the new technology is giving us. And so if you look back at a website from like, you know, the early 2000s, most of them would be more efficient and in some cases more accessible than like a really well optimized website now, just because we're layering in so much more in terms of design and technology, and 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 partly we get away with it because it's it's easy. The internet's fast, and we know it's going to be even faster tomorrow. So just right. you know, <laughs> throw things in. Um, but actually, I think a really considered approach. Again, it's about attention to detail of thinking how can we strip things back is uh, is is really necessary. We, yeah. we we need to we need to really optimize performance at every level. Absolutely. Um, you want to go to the next slide, Nicole? Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat uh, to a blog post Mighty Bytes wrote a while back. Um, when GDPR came out, the data privacy legislation in in the EU, um, a, a developer did a a, a test of, of removing all the the like user tracking and ad scripts and stuff from USA Today, a popular newspaper here in the U.S., um, and found out that uh, ninety percent of the actual data was in those scripts, and and um, that they basically pulled. Uh, the page, I don't exactly, oh, it's 5.2 megabyte page down to 500K. Um, and that's just by removing ad tracking and tracking user behavior and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, that in that list, we have, you know, optimized performance of all assets, what we just talked about, but making sure that, you know, you're not tracking things unnecessarily and prioritizing privacy and security goes a long way in, in helping, you know, make, make these, these uh, solutions, you know, more sustainable, lean and mean. Um, stuff and that goes for following, you know, kind of web standards and um, making sure we uh, at Mighty Bytes and, I, and Whole Grain, I, I'm sure, it shares this is using open source tools and modular frameworks for the work that we do. Um, and I know our devs try to write reusable code whenever possible. Um, anything else you want to add on this this topic, Tom? I, I think it's. I mean, we could we could spend a long time here. Um, yeah, and exactly. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and then there's like. Google and, and, and all kinds of folks have, have you know, written about this for years and years and years. There, there's so much content around this. Optimize, optimize, optimize. Yeah, yeah, totally. So with that in mind, let's go to the next, next screen. All right. Um, hosting strategies. So um, 
hosting is something that most people like particularly users but also i guess um uh, the producers of digital products don't often think about, but um, it's a huge deal uh, to really think about like, you know, how do we host our um, websites? Who's hosting them? How is, uh, how are these centers being powered? Um, and one of the things that I guess is really difficult about it is like, you don't know necessarily. I don't think that that's one of the things that a lot of places uses to market their services or don't like, offer while you're doing research. So how do you, you kind of track down this information or how should we think about uh, hosting our uh, digital products more responsibly? Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, so I mean, definitely this is a, this is a huge issue in terms of, I, I like the way Gary Cooks put this, that you know, the internet is the single biggest thing that we'll ever, we're ever gonna build. And, right. and it's all powered by electricity. So if we can, we can as an industry, prior, prioritize renewable energy, that will help shift the whole energy grid. Um, but if we don't, then we're actually kind of jeopardizing the whole kind of societal shift towards renewables. And, and so an easy way that we can do that um, without actually being like a data center provider, which is <laughs> most of us are not, um, is to use something like the Green Web Foundation database, yeah. which lists um, providers that have made a commitment to using renewable energy. And, um, and you can also kind of, you know, check, check websites and IP addresses using their API tool. But also in our experience, one of the best ways is to just kind of find the providers that you think meet your technical requirements and then, and then ask them the, the question, you know, ask them to see their sustainability policies and their commitments to renewable energy in writing. And, and you'll generally get like one of a few responses. You'll either get no response, um, You'll either and you know, and then you know that basically <laughs> they've not really thought about this, and they don't they don't want to talk about it, um, or you'll get a, a really great response which they may not publicize on their website. In which case, I always go back and say, "Hey, this stuff should be like front and center on your website." Um, or you'll get something kind of in the between where they'll say, "Yeah, actually, like this is stuff we care about, and it's stuff we're working towards, but you know, we're not all the way there yet." And that's you know that's great to hear, and and it's good to have that transparency. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we found uh, we we went through probably every green green web host uh, around uh, you know, when we were starting around this in the 10, 20, 2011, 2013. Um, we you know got test accounts with all of them and and really had challenges with a lot of them um, and and found that that um, and you know again this was seven eight nine years ago. Um, but what what they we were, you know, completely impressed by commitment to renewable energy with some of them, but we they didn't have the customer service or the uptime or the security and reliability that we needed. And so, you know, there's a whole bunch of things to consider here in the mix. And, you know, I love that they, you know, committed to renewable energy. But if you if I can't get a hold of anybody when I need them, you know, then then you know, per the Sustainable Web Manifesto, that's not a resilient service. You know, it's not really, uh, and so, you know, we went all, all over the place to find, you know, a good web hosting partner. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a long, long journey <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nicole, will you, uh, Fat, can you go one slide forward? So, um, I, you know, I wanna preface this by the fact that I'm certainly not a hosting expert um, and, and, uh, you know, no, there is not, not enough about, you know, Chris Adams, who is on here is probably knows way more than both Tom and I Definitely. combined um, <laughs> he's, 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 uh, on, on this topic for sure. Um, I, uh, but, you know, I'm happy to share with what, you know, what we, what we, the knowledge that we do have. Point one is for us, is, it has always been the top one, which is why I put it in the, in the, the list here. Um, and then, you know, we're a LAMP stack firm and, and, and so Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP are the tools of choice that we use um, when, when working on, on things. Um, Tom, do you want to add anything to this? I mean, there's, this is, yeah. a, a, like you said, a, like, like performance optimization in development, this is one of those rabbit holes that you could go down to and, and get really tweaky for a really long time, so. Yeah, you can. I mean, one thing I'd, I'd definitely say is on the hosting side, in addition to like the renewable energy kind of commitment, like the, the, the actual efficiency of the technology itself is massively important. And, and especially, you know, 
yeah. in, in overcoming some inefficiencies in in the kind of the code that we're using. So for example, you know, WordPress is an amazing tool, but it's not inherently efficient right. um, in, in the way that it works behind the scenes. But if you've got a really well optimized um, hosting service that's doing you know, pretty heavy caching so that there's minimal server load for every visitor, that's taking a lot of load off the servers and saving a lot of energy in the process. So it can, a good, a well, a well designed hosting service can actually really kind of minimize the energy demand. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's um move on to the next one, next slide. All right. Uh, other, otherwise, like I said, we could spend we, we only have an hour here and we want to get to QA for sure. <laughs> yeah, we have some good questions in the chat. So I would love to get to QA. But uh for business operations, um, so there's this observable fact that we have um, that companies that focus on sustainability or have uh, missions that are socially and environmentally minded have um, be have better outcomes. Um, they're more effective. They're, uh, they have better financial performance. They're more resilient. Um, and I guess the question there is uh, why? <laughs> why does it, why does doing good lead to doing well? Um, if either of you have an answer to that question. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think both Tom and I could, again, talk for an hour or two about this. I mean, you know, we, Mighty Bytes has been a B Corp since 2011. And, um, you know, having integrating purpose and, and profit and, and having a social and environmental mission at the core of the business and, and our business model has been incredibly important for us. It's, it's really is how we kind of define who we are as a business and what we stand for and stuff. It's where we put the line in the sand uh, in terms of things that we do and don't do. Um, I know that there are a bunch of B Corp fans in, in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, workshop or, or webinar. So I really appreciate that. Um, I wouldn't run my business any other way. I, I, I just, I just, I just know that that you know the B Impact Assessment, which is the tool that we use to kind of manage our impact, um, is this really great design tool for helping you design a better business and 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 create a roadmap for improving your impact over time. Um, and and it also just kind of gives you guardrails to say this is the stuff that we stand for as a business, and these are the things that we don't. And so. Um, you know, we're about to undergo our fifth B Corp certification, and I actually, it's an arduous process. It's a lot. It takes a lot of time, um, but I actually look forward to it, too, because it's a, ch a chance for me to take a step back and look at all the moving parts of my business and say, all right, what are, where are the areas that I can improve? What can we do better at? What, what, what is maybe not necessarily working? That kind of thing. Um, so I, I personally think that business operation strategies for digital agencies, especially, are core to this whole idea of sustainable web design. Tom, would you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything you just said. And in, in response to what Nicole said about, you know, why do, why do businesses that prioritize um, sustainability and, and sort of social purpose tend to perform better financially? And, and I think a big part of it is, I think a big part of it is that word purpose that when when there's a clear purpose within an organization that that intrinsically motivates people in a way that kind of just just going to work because that's my job doesn't doesn't do and and when you have um not just not just leaders but like entire teams and companies of people who are aligned with trying to create some real positive impact in the world it's a reason to get out of bed in the morning and try to do not just an okay job but try to do like the best you can possibly do and deliver like really really great products and services and i and i think that kind of an aspect of intrinsic motivation is a is a key factor in why they why they perform well and then they also attract really talented people because because those talented people want to do something meaningful with their skills yeah. and their time yeah totally yeah um next slide nicole please okay. thanks so uh, I mentioned this earlier and, and uh, track and verify impact using the B impact assessment or similar, there's other tools. The B impact assessment is not the only one out there, but you know, personally as B Corps, that's what we use. Um, you know, commit to improving economic benefits for stakeholders. I mean, that's really just making sure that, you know, the, the, the financial solvency that your company has is also helping any of your company's stakeholders. 
um, incorporating justice, equity, diversity, inclusion policies into your operations and your governance and everything about your business. Um, and then of course, divesting from fossil fuels whenever and wherever possible. We've, on the past year, um, we've been on a net zero journey. Um, and so we, we actually just got to a place where we can uh, offer carbon negative website hosting and such um, with our clients. And so um, that's, that's, that's been a driver for us for this is just, you know, how do we make sure that our organization eventually completely divests from fossil fuels and in, in all of its, its operations and business. Anything you wanna to add to that, Tom? I think, I think just to say that like, the, you know, the reason that we've included this here is because as, as people who work in digital projects, it's not just the projects themselves. Like we all work within organizations and those organizations right. have a, an impact in their own way on society, on the planet. And, and, and we all play a part in trying to make that as positive as possible. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I, I know there was, uh, next, next slide, please. That I know that there were some questions about like recommendations for, uh, you know, kind of some of these strategies. For each one of these things in these bullets that we, that we mentioned today, um, we, sustainablewebdesign.org is where we, um, is where we uh, Whole Grain and Mighty Bytes have been collaborating for the past few months on uh, a revamp of sustainablewebdesign.org um, and all of these strategies are included in there. And then under each strategy, there is at least one, if not several links to uh, out, out to posts about you know, that topic. And um, it's a 1.0 release. We just launched it on Monday. Um, there's still a lot of things like we wanna add a dark mode. We have some accessibility controls we wanna add to it. I mean, there's definitely some more things that we're, we're gonna be working on at it. But for now, um, in the preparation for this webinar, we wanted to get a, a base level or baseline of, of strategies out there that anybody on this web, website can, or, or on this webinar can use and reference and stuff. And um, you know, if you have strategies that absolutely think you need to be that need to be included, hit that contact button on there and, and feel free to send them to us. And, and uh, we'll be continuing to add to this and, and making it a better re resource. Absolutely, it's, this is going to evolve over time. So we really want people to right. feed into this and and make it a resource that everybody can benefit from. Yeah, and I think to that uh, next slide, uh, one of the main reasons is that someone we know has a book coming out on this topic <laughs> in a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that the, the site represented the book. And so Tom, tell us about your new book. Yeah, sure. So I don't know if people can see me on camera or whether they can only yep. see the slides, but yep. Woo! I, got the, I got the first copy of my, my <laughs> new book, Sustainable Web Design in the post today. That's um, awesome. Which, which is really exciting because I hadn't seen the actual book since it was uh, in its previous incarnation as a Word document. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's super exciting. Um, and one of the things, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I really want to put sustainability on the agenda of the web industry as like a serious topic that should be like included at the core of like all projects. And, you know, like we consider accessibility, like an important topic in our industry, we consider security and privacy important topics in our industry. We should be looking at sustainability in the same way. And that's, that was really my motivation for writing the book is to be one, just one more small drop in the ocean to like helping nudge, nudge things along in, in that direction. Um, if you link to the next slide, Nicole, um, I'll just give you a very quick overview. I'm not going to like bore you by <laughs> reading the whole book for the next 12 hours. But, um, what's inside the book? The book very much focuses on the envir environmental side of sustainable web design. So here in this webinar, we've been talking about people and planet and, and the book does talk about kind of the human side as well, but the core focus is very much um, how can we minimize our environmental impact? So it goes through like the what and the why, like why should we care about this as a topic? What is it? And, um, and, and how, is it, how is it relevant to our day-to-day -day work as people who work in digital? Um, there's then a chapter about like quantifying our own impact and benchmarking and trying to get a sense of like scale and being able to like judge success of are we actually managing to make tangible improvements? Um, there's then a chapter on design, which includes kind of real examples of like techniques that you can actually do in your, in your design process to make things more efficient while also improving user experience and accessibility, which I think is really key. 
Um, similarly for development, so real examples, it's not a coding book. This book is like written in a way that should hopefully be understandable to anybody who works on digital projects, whether you're a project manager or a marketing manager or a designer, developer. So it's not, you're not going to find code in the development chapter, um, but you will find like principles and examples that you can, you can follow and you can try to embed into your own projects. Similarly, hosting, we do a bit of a deep dive into like the kind of the, the nuances of what does like green hosting really mean and uh, open up that can of worms and get into it a little bit, but in a kind of accessible way um, and try to provide some practical advice on the things to look for when choosing a hosting, a hosting service. And then a question that's like commonly comes up that people commonly ask me is like, well, how do you actually sell sustainable sustainability in like the digital world? Um, get buy-in from your clients, get buy-in from your managers, get buy-in from your colleagues. Um, so there's a chapter really talking about that and, you know, draws on some of the experience that we've had at Whole Grain, also that Tim has had in his agency at Mighty Bytes over the years um, to shed some light on how to go about that. And then finally, just a chapter really reflecting on kind of, the resilience of the web itself in a changing climate and how we can do all these things to try and make digital have a less of a negative impact but hopefully even a positive impact on the environment but we should also reflect on how the climate is changing and that changes the web itself in terms of both the human needs of like the situations people might find themselves in in response to like natural disasters but also the physical infrastructure of the internet and how that can be affected by rising sea levels extreme weather events and so on um, and how we need to be thinking ahead and making our services as resilient as possible to to kind of get ahead of that awesome well kudos to you tom that's awesome we're really really happy for you that's thank you great. so it will be you can pre-order now and <laughs> i put the i put the link in i put the link in the in the chat to pre-order the nice. book it'll be out in two weeks so they'll yeah. start posting them out soon so the last thing we're going to cover, um, and I'm going to go through this quickly, I will put links to all the things that I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about in the chat, um, but I want to make sure we have time for Q&A, and we're already 10 minutes up on the hour. So I'm um, quickly whizzing through these slides. Um, we're going to talk about just kind of different resources. So Jerry McGovern's book, Worldwide Waste, my book on designing for sustainability, cross-cultural design from a book apart, the same publisher is publishing uh, sustainable web design. Next slide. Um, Whole Grain has put together a website carbon.com for, for actually tracking emissions of web pages. Um, in 2013, Mighty Bytes launched EcoGrader, which is kind of, I would say, the precursor to that. Um, and you know, it's on the list for us to over, overhaul it and give it a revamp um, uh, this year. So we were trying to get sustainable web design out the door, and, and that's kind of next in our site. So uh, next slide. Tom, you want to talk second for a second about Curiously Green? Yeah, just to say that we've got a monthly newsletter where we talk about things that are going on in this world of uh, greening the web, and um, you can you can subscribe to that in the footer of the Whole Grain Digital website or in the footer of the website Carbon website. And um, and I and I I um, I, re I invite uh, you to suggest what you want to see in there and, and and send over ideas and stuff. Great. Next slide, please. Um, so climateaction.tech, climatedesigners.org are two great resources, um, and I'm just going to kind of leave that as is, um, and I, again, I'll put the uh, URLs for these in the chat for people who want to click directly. Next uh, slide. Um, and then at, yesterday, I heard from James at Sustainable UX that they are going to have an upcoming event in Q3 of 2021. So sustainableux.com has been doing uh, 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 this topic, covering this topic since 2015 or 16. I think, um, and it's been typically a, a free annual uh, online con conference via YouTube Live um, and such. So there's a whole bunch of resources there um, to, to push further beyond this, um, but I wanna make sure that we can go to the next slide we can get into to, to Q&A um, because we are running short on time. I know that was a fast whiz through, but. All right, okay. So um, we have a few questions in the chat asking for some more uh, resources or um, recommendations for implementing and maintaining some of these strategies. Um, if you have any more specific questions, you can put them in the chat. Otherwise, um, I'm going to assume that those were answered by the last few slides. Um, 
also this deck will be available afterwards i know we went by that really fat went through that really fast so if you missed any of the urls you'll have access to all of the resources here afterwards um for our first question though we had some technical questions about um how to determine which uh how to determine which colors are the most resource intensive. And I just wanted to get those out of the way because those were the first few questions that came in. Um, do we have any specific strategies for that? Yeah, sure. So Google did a study. Um, it was based on their Pixel phones with OLED screens. And they, I mean, essentially the simple answer is that the brighter the color, the more energy it uses because OLED screens are basically tiny light bulbs. Um, so the whiter it is, the more energy it's using. Black is basically uh, switched off. Um, but the only kind of nuance there that they found was that blue, for some reason, out of all the colors that are not white, blue was the most energy intensive. It was about 25% more energy intensive than the uh, red and green pixels. All right. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have a question about how many people optimize their sites for Ecosia? instead of, Ecosia. or as well as Google? Yeah, that's a, I saw that question earlier. Thank you for, for it, Andrew. Um, I, you know, I, I'm under the impression, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe Ecosia uses, is it Bing's search results? It's Bing, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, honestly, for us, when we're, when we're thinking about optimizing a site, it's per, for performance. Um, and the search engine is ladder. Um, you know, obviously we want to optimize for search engines in terms of crawlability, um, but that, you know, web standards take care of a lot of that. Accessibility takes care of a lot of that and, and just optimizing your content in, in a way that is, is uh, useful. Um, so I can't say personally that we, you know, specifically look at Ecosia. I use it as my default search engine um, in, on, in my computer, but um, I can't say that we absolutely optimized uh, sites for that. Our, our goal at Mighty Bytes, at least, is to just follow search engine optimization best practices. Tom, is there anything different that you're doing? No, absolutely the same, yeah. All right. Uh, Veronica asks, how can you balance your business needs for advertising and tracking scripts with keeping your site live? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what, Tom, you answer that one. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Well, I think it comes back to this principle of really interrogating what, what you're trying to achieve. Um, so in terms of tracking, look at like, what is the data that you actually need and why do you need it? And, and once you know that, then look at what's the most efficient way, like what's, what are the most efficient tracking scripts that could achieve that? And even, you know, a lot of tracking scripts have ways that like, they have kind of minimal versions of them that you can that you can use but equally in terms of the advertising scripts there was an interesting case study i saw last week of the i think it was the dutch state broadcaster i can't remember what what they're called but um how they had removed personalized ads from their from their website and found that actually they ended up generating more revenue from ads by building their own ad server which we had non-personalized ads so that they could actually not have to worry about the GDPR implications. And, and I thought that was great because there's this kind of a, assumption that A, like more data is always better and B, more personalization is always better. And I think it's interesting that there's case studies coming out where people have challenged that and found that they can actually get better results with less tracking and less personalization. I would just add to that maybe on a, a layer of get permission too. You know, I mean, like whenever, yeah. whenever it's possible, uh, uh, is you know just adding the idea of of opt in. You know, to to all all those things. Yeah, uh, connected with this topic, I think, um, is is there something, uh, for example, storytelling that can make this connection for potential clients in terms of? Uh, I think this is in terms of how like selling sustainability in a sense. Like, how do you um, make clients understand that, like, this is an important thing that matters? <laughs> Tom, since you have a chapter of that on, on that, <laughs> I'm going to also defer to you on that one. I, think, I have thoughts, I think, but... <laughs> I think the key thing, no matter who you're talking to, is to understand what they care about, understand who they are, and, and talk to them in their own language about the things that they care about. And, and the interesting thing about, like, the kind of many sustainability strategies in, in digital projects is that they they tend to have 
positive benefits in other areas, whether that's improved conversion rates or improved SEO or improved user experience uh, or improved accessibility or, or a whole combination of these things. And I think that finding out what people really care about and then telling the story within that frame um, is, is tends to be the thing that, that gets them interested rather than trying to make somebody who's not that interested in sustainability become interested in sustainability. Right. Yeah, no, when we first started I, doing, oh, sorry, I didn't no, mean to interrupt you. Yeah. you. You blanked out there for a bit. Um, yeah, when we started first trying to sell this, we got a lot of kind of glazed over looks in, in the early days and, and realized that we kind of needed to adjust our approach accordingly. And, and I think exactly what you just said is a really, really smart way to look at it, for sure. Um, we're coming up on time, and I know there's a whole bunch of other questions on reusable design and headless CMS and, and WordPress and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, first of all, Thank you everybody for all of your questions. I'm sorry we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. Um, but I, you know, I do wanna actually close out with one, one thing that kind of I think touches on, on all, a lot of these questions. Um, we chose WordPress for sustainablewebdesign.org. Um, and we had a long conversation about this up front because we thought we really wanted to do like a headless, uh, you know, like a jam stack type thing um, and, and create a static site. Um, what we realized with the time that we had, um, you know, was that we didn't, you know, a big learning curve. Well, we're also trying to do our client work every day was going to be a real struggle for us um, in the amount of time we wanted to get sustainablewebdesign.org out um, by the time that the, uh, uh, the book came out. Um, we knew that there was going to be a 1.0 release and that there's going to be, you know, we're going to be adding to that and, and, and improving it over time. Um, and so, you know, I think these questions around like, you know, which, you know, whether you use a start CMS, whether WordPress is that CMS, whether or not you use one of these headless uh, approaches uh, really depends on a number of different factors. And for us, when, when whole grain and mighty bites were sitting down and trying to figure out you know, what's the best way for us to approach this, we ultimately landed in an area where we pushed our comfort zone a little bit, but we didn't go too far afield from it. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that, to that, Tom, but yeah. I think it's an important point to bring up in regards. To I think it is. And I think there's a lot of benefits to like, you know, Jamstack as a technology for, for efficiency of like technical efficiency and energy efficiency. But I think there's also, you can do a huge amount of optimized platforms like WordPress, like I said earlier, to get them very, very close to the same level of efficiency. And right. what you're getting at the same time is ease of like speed of development, if that's what your comfort zone is, and you're getting ease of maintaining content, which is equally important, like we were talking about earlier. Um, so you've got to weigh up those benefits um, based on like your own skills, your own knowledge, and, and what, what's going to work for you, but try to um, implement it in an efficient way. Cool. Thanks. Um, next slide, Nicole. I just wanted to close out with one uh, quick thing. We are uh, Mighty Bytes committed to doing these mo webinars monthly. Um, and so uh, our next one's gonna be on corporate digital responsibility and kind of exploring frameworks for helping organizations rethink about how digital products and services integrate with their business practices in a responsible way. So I put a link uh, in the, the chat uh, to uh, RSVP for our next one, which is gonna be at the end of February. Um, thank you all, everybody, for attending and for all the amazing, great questions. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom and Nicole, for going through all of putting through all of this together and, and going through it back and forth uh, and such. It's been really a good experience. Yeah, and thank you so much to all, all of you who attended. And we thank will uh, we will set up a, um, a send a thank you out with a link to the slide deck, uh, a recording uh, of the of the session. Um, and any other resources that were, that were, were shared here um, so that you'll have all of those in your inbox. Thanks very much. All right, bye-bye. All right.